With the current global situation, gyms all around the world are closing down and it's forcing many of us to have to do home workouts. Now, if you don't happen to have your own home gym, this means having to resort to using lighter weights or bodyweight movements in order to get those gains. While some people are able to continue lifting heavy, for most of us, buying these heavy weights and home gym setups is either logistically or financially infeasible. And that leads many of us to ask the question, is it actually possible to build muscle without heavy weights, or at least to maintain what you have built previously? Other than a lack of access, reasons you might want to know the answer to this question involves being physically incapable of lifting heavy weights. So things like a recent injury, or if you have a chronic condition, joint pain like arthritis. So can you actually build muscle or at least maintain it without lifting heavy? Well, the short answer is yes. And in this video, we're gonna go through three different methods you can use to do so and also touch on and how you can optimize your nutrition and finally end with an example of a workout program which you can follow. As we do on this channel, we're gonna go through some of the scientific literature to see what research has to say and how we can implement it into our training. Let's start with the common myth and that is to do with rep ranges. In the world of social media, it's quite common to come across this table which identifies three categories of weight training. The first category is lifting heavy weight with low reps leading to strength gains. The second is a more moderate weight with around 8 to 12 reps known as the hypertrophic range which is supposed to be ideal for building muscle and the third category is to have a low weight with relatively higher reps and that's supposed to develop your endurance. Now while there are some elements of truth to this it isn't the entire story and to get a better picture of that we need to understand the mechanisms that actually create or generate muscle growth. Now in the scientific literature, there are two main mechanisms for generating muscle growth that have the strongest amount of evidence. The first one refers to mechanical tension, and this is what is typically associated with using heavier weights and focusing on eccentric ranges of motion, which is letting the weight down where the muscle stretches out, creating micro tears within the fibers, then being filled in and leading to muscle growth. The second mechanism is more physiological in nature and is called metabolic stress. Now essentially this is when your muscles are working very hard with little rest so you get a lot of blood pooling around the muscle beds. This causes an influx of loads of chemicals and nutrients into the muscle cells and this causes swelling and expansion and tension on the membranes and this forces the muscle fibers to grow. Now hopefully that brief explanation illustrates why it's not as important to focus on the exact rep range or weight that's being used but rather it's more useful to think of how much work the muscle is actually doing and how much stress it's being exposed to. It's important to remember that muscles don't know any numbers like sets or reps or the weight we're using, that's all in our head. Instead, the muscle only knows how hard it has to work. And there are three methods we can use to influence this and here's number one. The first way is to modify our exercise variation. We can use the biomechanical leverages and different weight distributions to modify how we do the exercise and this is going to effectively make our muscle do more work and mimic the effects of using a heavier weight when we don't actually have any. What does this actually look like? Well, with bodyweight exercises, for example, push-up, you can use a variation such as the diamond push-up where your hands are closer to each other, or a decline where your legs are slightly elevated, and this is shifting the weight distribution towards the joints that are being worked, mostly the shoulder and elbow joint in the example of a push-up, and this is gonna lead to more tension in those muscles, the chest, the triceps, and the shoulders. But you can do this with other muscle groups as well. So for the legs, you can do pistol squats, for the back you can do wide grip pull-ups and here's a list of other bodyweight movements. Now if you have access to light weights like dumbbells, you can still do different variations to work those muscles harder. For example with the biceps you can do drag curls, and for the triceps you can do single arm overhead skull crushes and here's a list of other examples. This method of manipulating our technique optimizes the amount of weight that our muscles are actually moving and hence it favors the mechanism of mechanical tension which causes hypertrophy. Now if any of these standard variations of the exercises are already challenging for you then you can start with that and slowly transition to these modified variations which are slightly harder. This is going to provide progressive overload and is the same as increasing the weight that you're using in the gym. Now the second method is to use a low weight with high reps and based on the table that we looked at earlier it would indicate that this would favor endurance over muscle growth but let's look at what the science has to say. The first study we're going to look at was done back in 2012. They used 18 males and separated them into two groups both training their quadricep muscles 
One group was using a lightweight with 30% of their one rep max, and the second group was using heavyweight with 80% of the one rep max. And they trained their quadriceps like this three times a week for a total of 10 weeks. By the end of this 10 week period, they used scans to look at the muscle mass that the two groups had gained. And it turns out that there wasn't a significant difference between the two groups. And the group using the high weights only saw a significant increase when it comes to strength. Now these results sound promising, but we have to remember one of the main scrutinies of this study was that it only used untrained individuals. So the argument can be made that these increase in muscle mass was purely due to newbie gains seeing that they were at a beginner stage in their training. Fast forward four years to 2016 when the same group of researchers conducted the similar study again, this time improving of the weaknesses of the first. Now they were using individuals who were used to weight training and more of them, so 49. In addition, they started to test on whole body instead of just the quadriceps. The results? The exact same thing, that there was no significant difference in the amount of muscle built between the group who lifted heavy weights versus the group who lifted the light weights. And it also has to be mentioned that this is assuming that you're training to failure. In this 2016 study, as well as the 2012 study, the participants who were lifting light weights made sure that they trained to failure when they can't produce any more reps with good form, in other words. What's interesting to note is that because the high weight group was doing lower reps and the low weight group was doing higher reps, you might expect that the lower weight group with higher reps would have a greater proportion of type 1 muscle fibers, but the study actually found that there was no significant difference in the proportion of type 1 to type 2 fibers between the two groups. That's just something that may surprise most people, but I've touched on it on previous video and I'll link that up here. Finally, in 2017, a meta-analysis was conducted led by Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, who is commonly referred to one of the most, if not the most prominent figure when it comes to hypertrophy research. They looked at 21 different studies comparing muscle growth in low weight versus high weight groups when both of them were taken to failure, and they came to the conclusion that the low weight group had almost the exact same amount of muscle growth as the high weight group. They also found that the group doing high weights experienced significantly greater strength. The results of this meta-analysis are more inclusive as they involve studies that used male but also female participants, and so this makes our conclusion stronger. By now you should be able to see a pattern emerging, which is that we can build muscle with a low weight as long as we are going to failure and that the results are almost the same as using heavy weights at the gym. The mechanism of this can be explained by metabolic stress. The sarcoplasm of the muscle cells swell up and trigger protein synthesis. In most of these studies, the participants using a light weight did three sets of the exercise and each set was going to momentary muscular failure when they couldn't do one more rep with good form. Now the third method is something called restrictive blood flow training, or RBF for short, and it's something that most people haven't heard of. And it can be used to grow the muscles on your limbs, so your arms and legs. And just a disclaimer that you shouldn't be doing this if you have high blood pressure or peripheral arterial disease in your limbs. Having said that, for most people it's completely safe and is relatively easy to do because all you need is a resistance band and a light weight. This is how it's done. First, get a resistance band and wrap it around the top of your arm as if you're getting your blood taken. It should be tight enough where the veins become more visible as the peripheral vasculature is occluded, however the deeper arteries shouldn't be affected, so make sure that you still have a brachial and radial pulse in your wrist. Once you're set up, use your light weight and do some curls with that arm, so 10 to 15 reps, resting for 15 seconds and repeating it for a total of 3 sets. You get a crazy pump, but it can be a bit uncomfortable because of the lactic acid buildup, so this only needs to be done once in the workout. If you're wondering what the scientific evidence is for restricted blood flow training, there was a study done in 2013 when they took 20 trained males and used a crossover design. This means both groups got to choose both types of training. The program was for a total of 8 weeks and involved 4 weeks of restrictive blood flow training of the biceps, followed by 4 weeks of high intensity weight training of the biceps. And both groups switched around after the 4 week period for a total of 8 weeks. The results were that restrictive blood flow training was just as effective as building muscle as high intensity weight training was. And if you're wondering what's optimal for how frequent you should do it, a separate study found that two to three times a week is optimal for hypertrophy. Naturally, with restrictive blood flow training, you won't get as many reps in as you would normally because you're restricting blood flow to the muscle. This means it's optimal for people who have joint injuries or joint pain and can't do a lot of repetitions or use a high weight. The main mechanisms used to generate muscle growth in this type of training is hypoxia and metabolic stress like we spoke about earlier. Now, 
It goes without saying that diet is extremely important when it comes to building muscle, so I'll quickly touch upon that. The most important diet related factor for building muscle is having a high protein intake. This is the primary stimulant that's going to trigger the protein synthesis pathways and actually build the muscle. How much protein exactly? Well, I'd recommend at least one gram per kg of lean body weight, and that's lean body weight. So if you do have a higher percentage of fat, when you're making the calculation, just reduce the kilograms to what you think would be your lean body mass. You can go up to 2.5 grams per kilogram of lean body weight, and that is ideal for muscle growth, although it's not essential. So that's the spectrum and I'll leave the rest up to you. The second thing is what more people are familiar with as being linked to muscle growth, and that is a caloric surplus. Now it's not absolutely essential, you can build muscle at maintenance or in a slight caloric deficit, but it's definitely not optimal. So if we want to optimize muscle growth, we should use a caloric surplus of 100 to 200 calories above our maintenance. Now after going through the three different methods of building muscle, as promised, here's an example of a program you can use which incorporates these features. And it's worth mentioning that although light weights can be used to grow muscle, a lot of people prefer to use heavier weights either because they're trying to increase their strength as well, or because it's just more convenient as doing a higher amount of reps each time with a lower weight can just be time consuming and really draining on your energy levels. Hopefully now you have a better idea of how you can build muscle at home, whether your circumstance be due to lack of access to the gym or joint injury, joint pain, etc. Hopefully you've learned something new or at least found it interesting. If you did, make sure to share with your friends, subscribe for more science-based fitness videos. We just hit a thousand subscribers, which is a huge benchmark for me. So thank you to all of my subscribers. It's not too late to subscribe, join in before the 10K gang, but remember to work hard, work smart, and I'll see you in the next video.